This is the Homestead Journey Podcast, the podcast dedicated to the pursuit of self-sufficiency, self-reliance, and sustainability. This is episode number 57 of the Homestead Journey Podcast. Welcome, everyone. Thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedule to join us here on the Homestead Journey. My name is Brian Wells. I am coming to you from 3B Farm and Homestead here in beautiful upstate New York. And folks, it is still November of 2020 as I record this episode. And you know what that means. All month long, we are celebrating the one year anniversary of the launch of the Homestead Journey podcast. So cue the music. Now, I have no idea who Lucy is, uh, but thanks to MarkHumbleMusic.com for that rendition of Happy Birthday. That's right, folks. Here all month long on the Homestead Journey podcast, we are celebrating our one-year anniversary of the launch of the show. And you can celebrate with us by winning fabulous prizes. First of all, you can enter to win by leaving us a review on iTunes or if there's a platform that you use that allows for reviews, certainly do that. And then shoot me an email, brian at thehomesteadjourney.net, just to make sure I don't miss it. Secondly, you can enter by tagging us in social media using the Homestead Journey podcast. So share the podcast, tag us and you will be entered to win. Finally, if you head on over to our website, there's a special link that you need to follow, giveaway.thehomesteadjourney.net slash birthday, and if you fill out that form, you will be entered to win as well. So we're gonna be doing this all month long, and then the first week of December, we will be drawing names, and you will be winning fabulous prizes. Now, what are those fabulous prizes? Well, that is a great question. First of all, I am going to be giving away some mugs from Creek Road Pottery, which is a pottery run by my brother-in-law, Al. He's hand-throwing some mugs for us, and he gave me a sneak peek this week. Gotta love those Dr. Seuss rhymes that I'm dropping there. (laughs) <laughs> but he gave me a sneak peek this week of the mugs that he's thrown for us. They look great. So you're definitely going to want to enter to win. If for no other reason than to win those mugs, they they really look awesome. And if you want to see more of Al's work, check him out, creekroadpottery.com. He really is trying to provide functional art so that even the common Joe like you and me can enjoy hand-thrown pottery. That's his passion. That's his mission. So check out creekroadpottery.com. Secondly, we're going to be giving away some of our fabulous t-shirts. We've just launched a t-shirt store. We've got a couple of designs up there right now. If you want to check those out, teespring.com. So T-E-E spring.com slash store slash the Homestead Journey podcast. And I've got links to all of this stuff in the show notes. So if you want to head on over to the show notes, you can get those links there as well. But we'll be giving away t-shirts, giving away mugs, fabulous prizes all month long in celebration of one year of us journeying together towards self-sufficiency, self-reliance, and sustainability. With all of that said, let's jump right on over to this week's Homestead Happenings, and I will bring you up to speed with what we've been doing here on 3B Farm and Homestead. Obviously, folks, it's that time of year when the days are getting shorter, and it won't be long, and we'll be going to work in the dark, coming home in the dark, and so I've really been trying to make hay while the sun shines, so to speak, 
And so it was a very, very busy week here on the homestead as we've been preparing things for the winter. But a big part of the week this week was dealing with the geese and ducks that we processed last weekend. And in particular, I went ahead and tried my hand at making duck and goose prosciutto, utilizing the breasts, some of the ducks, and some of the geese that we processed. I did a couple of different variations of it, some with the skin on, some with the skin off, and that is all hanging right now in the cellar aging. Now, if you're not familiar with the process, it's really fairly simple. What you do is you take the the breasts and you put them in salt. You let them sit in, in salt. I used kosher salt. You let them sit in salt for about 24 hours. Then you wrap them in cheesecloth. After you dust them with some pepper, you wrap them in cheesecloth and you let them hang for about seven to 10 days. And what you're trying to do is to get it to lose about 30% of its weight, and then at that point, you have a, hopefully we will have, <laughs> an edible product. I have never made this before. I do have some pork prosciutto that has been aging down in our basement now for almost two years, since December of 2018, and so I'm looking forward to cutting into that soon. I had actually planned on eating that or sampling that sooner this year, but because of COVID, it made things difficult for my father-in-law to come up. And I really wanted my father-in-law to be here when we cut into it. And then when he did come up, I forgot about doing it. And we were hoping they would come up for Thanksgiving, but they're not coming up for Thanksgiving. So I, anyhow, I don't know when I'm going to get into that. But the great thing is with the duck and goose prosciutto is it takes much less time. So instead of aging it for the 18 months or almost 24 months that I've aged the pork prosciutto, this should be done in about 7 to 10 days, maybe a little longer, but certainly a lot quicker than the pork prosciutto. I did go ahead and take the legs off of them as well. We'll be doing those confit, which is basically, from my understanding, I've never done that before either, but you cook it in fat, but you do it kind of low and slow. So instead of deep frying it, you're cooking it in the fat at a lower temperature. So I'm very excited to try that out. And then with the uh, carcasses that we had left, I tried my hand at making stock or really broth from uh, both the duck and the geese. I just combined them together. So it's kind of a combo and very excited to try that out. This is the first time I've ever made broth from a duck carcass. And obviously this is the first time we've ever eaten uh, goose. So the first time I've ever tried my hand at that. And so I'm very excited to see how that works as it stacks up against chicken broth. As I asked about that this week, many people suggested you could use them interchangeably. So we will see how that all works out, but very excited about that. We moved our chickens from the mobile coop and the roost out bed down to the winter coop for the winter. And so then I went ahead and prepared the roost out bed for next spring. If you follow us on Instagram or Facebook, you would have seen pictures of how I went ahead and top dressed that area with our aged manure and compost and then put down a fresh layer of hay. And so hopefully in the spring, we will be ready to rock and roll. And we're going to talk more about the roost stout bed in this week's charting the course. Today, I had the opportunity to try out my new gadget that I talked about a couple of weeks ago, and that is the truck bed unloader. I had the opportunity this week to go ahead and get that installed. I had to make a few modifications to it because the tarp is designed for a regular pickup bed, and what I have is a Ford Ranger. So I had to cut that tarp down a little bit and make it narrower. Now, if you didn't hear me talk about this a couple of weeks ago, I went to Harbor Freight and bought something that they, I guess they referred to it as a truck bed unloader. In essence, what it is, it's a fancy tarp that is connected to a shaft that you connect to the top of your tailgate. There's some brackets and then it connects to the top of the tailgate. And so what you do is you pull this tarp to the front of the bed 
while the tailgate is up and you load your truck bed like you normally would. So in our case, it's wood chips. And then when you're ready to unload the wood chips, you put the tailgate down and you crank that tarp. And as it does, it basically acts as a conveyor belt and whatever's in the back of your truck then comes out. So today we were able to put that to the test. And folks, let me tell you something, it works like a charm. So what we did is we went down to the town barn, we got wood chips, came back to the house. I put the tailgate down. My son brought the tractor over with a bucket and I cranked out a load of wood chips and then he dumped them into the pig pens. And then he came back over. I cranked out some more wood chips. He dumped them into the pig pens. And let me tell you something, folks. It is slicker than snot on a glass doorknob. It worked very, very well. I give it two thumbs up. Well, I'll give it a thumb and three quarters up because it was a bit of a pain in the butt that I had to tweak it. To, to make it work in the back of my truck. So I do wish that they would sell maybe a narrower version designed specifically for smaller pickup trucks. But other than that, as far as function, it worked as advertised very, very well. And I was just, I was blown away. It certainly is a huge back saver for an old codger like me. And so very, very happy. And for 35 bucks, uh, you know, it was definitely well worth the investment. The last thing I wanted to share with you is that I was interviewed this week for another podcast. And so that's supposed to be coming out, I believe this coming week. And when that drops, just keep uh, watch on our social media, on Facebook and Instagram in particular. I will let you know when that interview is out. You're definitely not going to want to miss it. It was just a lot of fun talking with this other podcaster. And so I think, um, well, maybe I'm biased, but uh, I think it's going to be a, a good time. And it was just a lot of fun chatting with him. So that's what happened this week on 3B Farm and Homestead. I hope things are well where you are at. Let's jump on over to this week's Charting the Course. As I said earlier in the Homestead Happening segment, this week I spent some time up in the Ruth Stout bed putting it to bed, so to speak, <laughs> for the winter, preparing it for springtime. And as I was up there working, I realized something. And that is that I had shared with you guys that I was doing this experiment with the Ruth Stout gardening method, but I never really had given you the full report the full uh, the full results of this experiment. And so today what I want to do is share with you what went well, what didn't go quite so well, and what I plan on doing differently next year with our Ruth Stout Garden area. Before I do that though, let me just kind of, for people who are new, bring you up to speed with the Ruth Stout gardening method. If you're not familiar with it, the Ruth Stout method is a method of gardening that utilizes deep mulch, kind of like how Back to Eden utilizes wood chips or there's lasagna style gardening. But what the Ruth Stout method uses for its mulch predominantly is hay or straw. Now it was designed by a lady by the name of Ruth Stout, thus the name, who was a very avid gardener back, I believe, in the 50s, 60s, and into the 70s. So it's a method that's been around for quite a while. It's something that I ran across, I think, for the first time last year. I don't believe I'd ever heard of it before last year, although the funny thing was, if you listen to last week's episode, my dad mentioned that our it would have been his aunt, my great aunt Eva, used this method back in the day when my dad was young and was spending time at their homestead, she utilized the Ruth Stout method in their garden. So again, it's not anything that's new, but it's something that was new to me last year. And so I decided that I wanted to try it out. I had an area that I was wanting to turn into garden, that I wanted to do some kind of no-till method. And I wasn't quite sure how I wanted to approach it. I had thought about utilizing the Back to Eden method. But then when I ran across the Roost Out method, I opted to go ahead and give that a try. So last year, about this time, I went ahead and 
put down a layer of compost in an area that we had had chickens and ducks and geese on basically all summer long. So they had really taken this area of lawn and really eaten it down to the dirt. And then again, I went ahead and put the uh, compost down, put the hay down, and we just left it all winter long. And so in the spring, I went ahead and put a fence around this garden area. I got a broad fork, I broad forked the area, and we went ahead and planted into it. So what went well, what didn't go so well, and what would I do different next year? Before we get into that, though, let me share with you a couple of things that people told me were going to happen that never happened. First of all, I had some people kind of scoff at me and tell me it was a horrible idea because by putting down hay, what I was doing was seeding this area and I was just going to have a big old hay field where I put the hay down. Well, trust me, folks, that did not happen at all. Uh, I did not have a huge problem with weeds, and I certainly did not have a hayfield grow where this garden area was. The second thing people told me is that I was going to have to replenish the hay quite a bit. And in fact, some people said that the amount of time that you spent putting hay in kind of outweighed the amount of time that you saved in weeding, and so they didn't care for the method because of that. That didn't happen for me either. I did not find that I had to keep replacing hay in this area. Now, there's part of me that wonders if the reason why is because we had such a dry season this year. And because there wasn't that moisture there, the hay just didn't really have an opportunity to rot down like it might otherwise do if it was a more uh, moist type environment. So I certainly did not spend all summer long schlepping hay up to the roost out bed and having to keep putting it down. Before we get into the good, the bad, and the ugly, shall we say, <laughs> as it relates to our experience with the roost out method, let me give you some information with regards to what we planted in the bed and how we planted it. First of all, I planted everything utilizing square foot garden spacing, and I actually laid out beds that I think were about four by 12 in size. I really was trying to maximize the use of space in this area. I planted some things from transplants, so broccoli, eggplant, peppers, tomatoes, squash, cucumbers, and melons. I planted a few things from seeds. So I did plant some squash from seed, some cucumbers from seed. I think I did some melons from seed. And I also direct sowed some beans, beets, rutabagas, and lettuce. I also planted some onion sets, some garlic cloves a little later on, and then some Irish potato seed potatoes. And then finally, we also planted two different types of sweet potatoes. I planted some utilizing black fabric and some I planted utilizing hay as mulch. So what went well and what didn't go so well? By and large, most of the transplants did well. The eggplant, the peppers, the tomatoes, some of the squash, all of that did fairly well. Now the broccoli, it never really produced a head and in fact, it pretty quickly went to seed. I'm not quite sure what happened there. The cucumbers never took and it didn't matter whether it was from seed or whether it was transplants, they never took off at all. Some of the squash from transplant survived, some of it didn't, some of it that I direct sowed came up and did well, some of it didn't, and none of the melons survived at all. The onions came up okay, but they really didn't generate nice big bulbs. Uh, the Irish potatoes produced fairly nice looking plants, but when we went to harvest them, out of 40 some odd 
plants, I got about a half of a wheelbarrow load of potatoes. The beans came up fairly well. I direct sowed some filet beans. They came up fairly well. The beets did not come up hardly at all. The rutabaga didn't come up hardly at all. And the lettuce, it came up. But by that point, I was so frustrated with the lack of production of stuff from seeds, I actually forgot to even harvest that lettuce. The sweet potatoes that I planted in the black fabric, they didn't produce hardly anything at all as far as vines go. The stuff that I put into the hay produced some nice vines, but when I dug them up, I had one decent sized sweet potato. So to be honest with you, production wise, it was a little bit on the underwhelming side. The tomatoes, the peppers, the eggplant, and some of the squash did produce fairly well, but ra the rest of it really didn't produce much, if at anything at all. Now, I did like the method because of the fact that I did not have to pull many weeds. And when I did have to pull weeds, they were very, very easy to pull. Sometimes I actually put down a little bit of hay over top of them, but most of the time I just pulled the weeds and they came up very easily. What I found was direct sowing seeds into the hay, having to pull the hay back, was really a pain in the butt. And in particular, trying to utilize square foot garden spacing instead of a row that where you would pull back and plant into the row, that was very, very frustrating. The other thing that I found when I went to harvest the potatoes is that the ground underneath the hay was very, very dry. In fact, it was as dry as if I think I would have not had any hay there at all. Now, it was a very dry summer. There is no doubt about that. Here in the Northeast, it was a very, very dry summer. And by design, I did not irrigate the roof stout bed hardly at all. I did go ahead and spray some water on some of the transplants when I first put them in and some of the seeds when I put them in, I, I did go ahead and wet down that area. But other than that, I did not consistently water this bed at all, all summer long. And again, that was on purpose. There was a method to my madness. Somebody who lives in Texas who claimed to use the roost out bed extensively said, oh, our summers in Texas are hot and they're dry. We don't get a lot of rain. And the roost out bed just keeps the soil underneath there so moist and so nice and so lovely. And I don't have to water at all. So I thought, let me go ahead and give it a whirl. Now, quite frankly, I should have been a little smarter and checked underneath the hay during the summer to kind of see what was going on, and I did not do that. But trust me when I tell you that when I went to harvest the potatoes and I pulled back that hay, it was very, very dry underneath. So what am I going to do different next year? Well, first of all, is I am going to water it, and I will probably just set up some sprinklers. I'm not going to invest in a lot of drip irrigation until I figure out how I want to lay my beds out, so I'll probably just utilize sprinklers, but I am going to consistently water this bed just like I do my raised beds. The second thing I'm going to do differently next year is I am not going to utilize square foot garden spacing with the exception of potato beds. Those I will utilize the square foot garden method. I will go ahead and set those up in four by 12 type, uh, a four by 12 type layout and then plant by the square foot. But other than that, I will go ahead and plant in single or double rows like you would in a quote-unquote traditional in-ground garden type method. The third thing I'm going to do next year is really reserve the roost out bed for transplants. 
I'm not going to focus a lot on direct sowing in the roost out bed. I will direct sow in the square foot garden beds and in the roost out bed, I'm pretty much only going to do transplants. The only exception to that will be my Irish potatoes. I'm also going to try onion sets up there again. Though when I do the onion sets in the roost out bed, I'm only going to do them in hay and not actually put them in the ground. I believe that's what Amy over to Farmish Kind of Life did this year and she had great success with it. So that's kind of how you do the potato thing. So I'm going to do that with the onions and see how that turns out. I will also do a little better job of getting my potatoes started. So I went ahead and got my seed potatoes. I cut them up. I let them scab over and then I went ahead and planted them instead of allowing the eyes to go ahead and start growing before I planted them. And so I'm going to try to get the seed potatoes a little bit earlier and then get them kind of started before I plant those in the hay next year. But I am definitely going to give the roost out method another go. I think that a lot of the lack of production that I saw was my fault because I wasn't watering it like I should and like I, and because I was trying to use that square foot garden spacing instead of planting in rows and ensuring that the seeds had better contact with the soil. But I also just think that with the roost out method, perhaps transplants are a little bit better way to go, at least when you're trying to get the garden bed established. I think with a lot of the deep mulch garden methods, you really need to garden with that method for a few years before you really start seeing the benefit of those methods. I've read that with regards to Back to Eden, some of the lasagna style gardening approaches. And so I'm definitely going to give it another year, maybe another two years, and then we'll kind of reevaluate it at that point. But so far, uh, the jury's still out for me with regards to the roost out method. If you have any tips or tricks, if you are someone who has used the roost out method and had success with it, I would love to hear from you. Reach out to me, Brian, at thehomesteadjourney.net or reach out to us on social media and let me know what your tips and tricks are. Or if you're someone who has tried it and it didn't work for you, I'd also love to hear your feedback with regards to that as well. So certainly reach out to me and let me know your thoughts on the Ruth Stout method. All right, folks, that's it for this episode of the Homestead Journey podcast. I really do appreciate you spending time with us. If you'd like to support the show, you can do so in a couple of different ways. First of all, you can simply share the show with friends and family, people that you think might benefit from it. You can also, as I suggested earlier, leave us a review on your favorite podcast platform. But you can also support the show by shopping with us. So if you go to teespring.com slash stores slash the Homestead Journey podcast, we do have a number of different t-shirt and sweatshirt designs up there. And so by buying that, you are helping support the show. And if you go to our website, thehomesteadjourney.net slash shop, there is a list of affiliate links to Amazon of products that we use and love here on our homestead, and we think that you might enjoy using them on your homestead as well. As always, the music on this episode, with the exception of the happy birthday music, was provided by Audionautics.com, so a big shout out to them, and until next time, everybody, keep up the good work.